Hi there, I'm Lauren Pastrana. Thank you for joining us for this CBS News Miami special presentation celebrating Hispanic heritage. Over the next half hour, we're bringing you stories that spotlight people and places enriching the community while honoring their own rich culture. We begin with one local Mexican American who's doing his part to make sure every family has food on the table. Paco Velas lives a life of service. He's worked at food banks for more than 20 years, currently serving as the president and CEO of Feeding South Florida. Everything happens around the dinner table. And for many of our families, those ingredients that bring people together at that dinner table are missing. And that's what we as an organization help provide. Velas himself is a mix of special ingredients. Born to a Native American father and a Mexican American mother in Waco, Texas, he grew up in the small border town of Eagle Pass. Being Mexican American or being of Hispanic culture, for me, helped me, especially when I left Eagle Pass, helped me embrace my Mexican culture even more because I started missing that culture. I started missing the food, I started missing the people, I started missing everything that made my parents, my grandparents, and myself Mexican. He admits moving to South Florida was a big change for him. There are not a lot of Mexican uh, individuals here in the state of Florida compar compared to other nationalities from around, from around the world, and especially Central and South America and from the Caribbean. So not everybody wants black beans, I want pinto beans. Right? Not everybody wants certain kinds of food. They want specific food that's going to make them feel like they're with family, like they're at home. But for many in our community, food insecurity is real. South Florida is home to one of the largest concentrations of Latinos in the country. More than one in five SNAP participants are Latino, and Latinos also make up more than 40 percent of WIC participants. For those individuals who help put food on the table for others, farm workers, servers, um, people that work at grocery stores, they help families put food on the table, but they themselves struggle to put food on their own table. And that's an unfortunate situation. That's not right. That's not just. And that's why Velas works every day in an effort to end hunger in South Florida, making an impact one meal at a time. Thank you. Que Dios te bendiga. The story of the Bay of Pigs invasion is woven into the fabric of South Florida. As time goes on, we are losing more veterans who were part of that operation. CBS News Miami's Hank Tester shows us how two local museums are scrambling to preserve their history. Big plans for a $2 million expansion of Little Havana's Bay of Pigs Museum. That's Rafael Montalvo, president of the Bay of Pigs Veterans Association, along with Carlos Luis, president of the museum and library. Montalvo is a Bay of Pigs veteran. Luis is the son of a veteran of the April 1961 CIA-sponsored attempt to overthrow the Cuban regime, headed by Fidel Castro. A great deal of the new museum is going to be audiovisual. Telling the story of the landing on the south coast of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, a force of 1,500 Cuban volunteers determined to take back their country, a gallant yet failed effort that ended in prison for a majority of the landing force, death for others. That's the message here, that, that freedom is worth dying for and offering your life for. And it's a race against time. Many of the Bay of Pigs veterans are now elderly in their 80s, and some are not doing well. Felix Rodriguez heads the Crosstown City-sponsored Hialeah Gardens Museum honoring the Brigade 2506. Now we are getting individuals here, younger, that we are going to train uh, to be able to give a tour of this museum with the scene that we know. So they will be able, when we are no longer around, they will be able to give a tour of everything that is inside this museum. And there's plenty to see in the city-sponsored museum that has the feel of a Cuban home. Broad windows, an atrium full of lots of pictures, weapons, memorabilia. Outside a tank from the era and an A-26 used in the operation. What's it like for you to, to watch children and grandchildren of the veterans coming through here? It's a great personal satisfaction to be able to provide that for them. Two museums scrambling to tell the story and challenged by Father Time. Of the original members of the entire Brigade 2506 operation, 
there's probably 300 left, and you know, half of them have the beginning of dementia. Are you sitting down with these guys, videotaping them, and asking them to tell their story? We have. We have uh, over 110 uh, veterans which we videotaped, right? And we're going to make sure that we go ahead and display them in our new museum. If you want information on how to visit these two museums, take a look at our website. That's cbsmiami.com. In Hialeah Gardens, I'm Hank Tester, CBS News Miami. We're getting personal with the star of VH1's reality TV show, Love and Hip Hop Miami. Her name is Diana de los Santos. She also has a distinct stage name. The Dominican American star and Miami native sat down with CBS News Miami's executive producer impacting communities, Tanya Francois, to share why her heritage means so much to her. Amara La Negra is a Latin reality and former child star. And as I found out, there's so much more to her than the person you see on TV. Afro-Latina actress and hip-hop star Amara La Negra has a new song she's singing. Qué linda, siéntate. In between the siéntate. 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 Amara La Negra's latest hit is a simple twinkle, twinkle little star. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. The reality show star, performer, and now mom of two also has a thing for names. Exhibit A, her 17-month-old twins. Their names are Su Majestad Royalty and Su Alteza Empress, which means Your Majesty and Your Highness. Amara La Negra was born in Miami to Dominican parents. Her mother came to America crossing the Mexican border. An only child, her career in show business started when she was just a couple of years older than her daughters are now. I started when I was four years old in Salo Gigante, a very well-known TV show for the Latino community. I was there for six years every Saturday. It was an amazing platform for me to grow in. Despite early stardom, growing up in South Florida has had its challenges. I, I was homeless in Homestead um, by, um, I used to live in this community called Waterstone by Speedway. And I would park in front of the McDonald's or the Walmart close to Florida City. I would bathe with wipes in the bathrooms. It was literal and figurative hunger that helped her gain success. She was born Diana de los Santos, but it's the meaning behind the stage name she gave herself that explains her rise and her platform. Originally, it was because nobody would remember my name. So they would be like, what's the black girl's name? What's La Negrita's name? What, what, what? And then it just stayed like La Negra. And then uh, years after, you know, everyone kept telling me, oh, take La Negra off. It sounds racist. It sounds this. And I was like, it doesn't sound racist to me at all. I love to be called black. I, I enjoy when people say that my melanin and my blackness is beautiful. La Negra is working a lot these days. When not with her twins, she's on a host of Spanish language shows, including the Spanish version of Dancing with the Stars and most famously, Love and Hip Hop Miami. I'm a single mom taking care of my family and I am doing everything I can to promote my brand and to bring in money. When she's not on TV, Amara also dabbles in real estate and she has a cosmetic line. Her motivation, she says, are her family and those days of homelessness and hunger. I just grew up with my mother. I think that also that isolation made me become even more focused and more driven with my goals and my visions in life. And I just want them to know that anything in life is possible as long as you focus, you concentrate, you sacrifice. I asked Mamara La Negra what's the message she hopes to share and one day pass on to her daughters. She said it's that their mother is a warrior, a fighter, and one tough cookie. In the studios, Tanya Francois, CBS News, Miami. When we come back, it's a common seasoning found in many homes all across the world, but where did it come from? We have the history behind those little sazon packets when we come back. The Miami Herald has a new executive editor, and he's from right here in South Florida. His own story is one of illegal immigration, working from the bottom and now rising to the top ranks of one of the nation's largest newspapers. He also shared his story with CBS News Miami's Tanya Francois. 30 years ago, Alex Mena was answering phones, taking baseball scores at the newspaper he now leads. Today, he still answers phones, but it's in his own office and as the newspaper's executive editor. 
Alex Mena's story begins in Hialeah, but his journey to get to South Florida isn't as simple to tell. It started at 11 years old, on his father's back, as they fled Nicaragua to avoid being forced into the military. My father and I don't know how to swim, uh, but we needed to get across, you know, so my father told me to get on his back, and, you know, we were crossing, you know, Rio Grande. And my, I still remember the stories that my dad said that, you know, the water got up to his chin. Along the way, the menace faced danger, but there was no turning back. You know, we saw, you know, people in, in uniforms. We, I can assume it was Mexican police or military that came in and took our coyote away. I mean, they, they beat him for what it looked like to me, you know, 11 year olds eye to death. It was 1984 when Mina crossed the Rio Grande to Hialeah. By 1992, Mina was a graduate of Hialeah Miami Lakes High School. He went on to Miami-Dade College, and that's where his passion for journalism was sparked. A professor, David Mervis, uh, was the advisor at the Falcon Times. That's the Dayton North uh, student newspaper at the time. Uh, he saw something in me. He, he, he saw, I guess, a drive. Uh, a, a willingness to work hard. Three months later, in February of 1993, the Herald needed a clerk. I'm doing box scores for, you know, NFL games, for baseball games. For 30 years, including a two-year stint at the Sun Sentinel, Mena would climb. I got the opportunity to become the assistant uh, uh, sports editor for Broward High Schools. And that's when I started saying, oh, you know, may maybe I can be the deputy sports editor someday. Then I become deputy sports editor and I said, well, maybe I can become uh, the sports editor or the 1A editor, you know, or, or the production chief or the news editor. And I became all of those things. And now he's even more. I want to be known as the person who made sure that we profile the people who make a difference, you know, in, in, in our communities. Mena says just being able to make it in Miami makes him Miami proud. That's my Miami story, you know, uh, and, uh, a, a Nicaraguan immigrant who marries a Cuban daughter of an exile family. It's, it's Miami. Mena says in the short term, his goals for the Miami Herald remain the same. That's to hold elected officials accountable and continue to do the hard news readers are used to. The Miami Herald and CBS Miami are news partners. In the newsroom, Tanya Francois, CBS News, Miami. Latinos are historically underrepresented in higher education, but one local woman is making history at Florida International University, her alma mater. CBS News Miami's Maribel Rodriguez introduces us to Dr. Elizabeth Behar. You came here for your master's and now you're like second in command of one of the largest universities in the country. How does it make you feel? I mean, just look around. So proud. So proud of all the work that our students, our faculty and our staff do. And uh, I, I'm really blessed and, and really excited about the opportunities that FIU has for our community. And it's a community she knows all too well. I did grow up uh, in Miami with this community. Uh, the family moved around as many Cuban exiles did around the nation to stabilize, ended up back in Miami. Um, and I was raised here, a uh, little bit of public school, um, graduated from St. Brenton High and um, have been in education uh, my entire professional career. A professional career that is making history. Dr. Elizabeth Behar is the first Hispanic female and first alumna to serve as provost, executive vice president, and chief operating officer at Florida International University. Certainly it's humbling um, and bears a lot of responsibility on, on, uh, on my shoulders, but it's really exciting. The university, our South Florida community, we're all at an inflection point that's just really, really exciting about the future of our community. This wife and mother of two now walking the West Miami-Dade campus she once attended, helping other students achieve their dreams. I couldn't be more proud of the work that we've done, um, the growth that we've had, the impact that we're making. We every day work and live towards the American dream. We are changing lives and this community is changing the face of this country. We are so excited. And she is changing the face of the university, thanks to her parents who left Cuba in search of the American dream. And although Dr. Behar was born in the U.S., she will never forget where she came from. We focus on family. We focus on our culture. We focus on our values, the Hispanic values, um, education, family, um, whatever faith you happen to have. Those are those are strongly rooted in in who we are um, and uh, our dedication to to making sure that we are a community and that we're members of a broader um, 
we call it ecosystem, other people call it networks. And Dr. Behar also told me every day she gives 100% of herself and treats every member of the university with respect as if they were her own family, the students as her own children, and always gives them the best advice. Work hard with integrity and do the best you can. Maribel Rodriguez, CBS News, Miami. You may have a packet of Sussone seasoning in your kitchen, but did you know the family who created it lives right here in South Florida? CBS News Miami's Chelsea Jones takes you through the origin of that powerful packet and all that it's become. This tiny pouch packs a loud punch and you can easily find it at your favorite grocery store, but it was birthed in Puerto Rico through a boots on the ground effort and it's now grown worldwide. The creators brought it right here to South Florida. Hasta que surgió el nuevo sazón Goya con culantro y achiote para darle mucho más sabor y también más color. The Cuban revolution stripped Jose Pepe Ortega of everything he once knew. So when a job opportunity opened up in Puerto Rico, he jumped. And while there, he birthed something he knew was a hit from the start. He came up with the perfect blend of ingredients that he thought was um, magical. The operation started small, and most everything was done by hand. Had my grandmother pitching in, <laughs> my mom, my sister, we were all uh, pitching in to you know, make the blends and put the, fill the pouches and fill the cases. Pepe was Jose Ortega's dad and his namesake. He remembers the labor of love it was to get people to get behind this little pouch of seasoning. It was, um, it was not easy to convince um, the grocers to buy this because it's, it was a new thing. They know what garlic is, they know what, uh, you know, salt, pepper, but this was a unique blend. But the original manufacturer was making changes, and the Ortegas knew they needed to do the same. So they partnered with the Yunanwe family, and Sason Goya was born. It was a match made in heaven, pretty much. This picture is the inauguration of the factory in Puerto Rico in 1973. This is my father. This is Pepe Ortega. This family affair is embarking on 50 years of partnership. The first displays that, that we had, uh, this is probably 1970 or somewhere around there. How does it feel to look back at that? We've come a long way, baby. The production line went from this to this. They gave us the tools, they gave us, they taught us, uh, and uh, they gave us the work ethic, and uh, they, uh, they would be very, very proud of where we are today. Frank Unanwe is third generation Goya. It was his dad and uncles that worked directly with Pepe Sr. The family affair began because there was trust that these Sasson packets would continue flavoring food their way. He didn't feel that the company was going to be, the product was going to be in good hands with the new company. So in order that his consumers would continue to get the quality that they had been accustomed to. The groundwork was laid, and now the fourth generation of both families are working in tandem to continue Pepe's legacy. I think he'd be particularly proud of Natalia, <laughs> my daughter. <laughs> She's really running this. She's really pushing this boat forward. I, was, I almost feel like I was a, um, a placeholder between him and her. I'm getting to build a relationship with him in a way that I, that I didn't get to while he was alive. I asked. What would Pepe say if he were alive to see all that Sasson has become? He'd say, I told you so. I told you the product was awesome. They're taking the Sasson truck on the road to celebrate 50 years to continue connecting customers, employees, and the community. Birth from the hands of the Ortegas right to your kitchen table. In the studio, I'm Chelsea Jones, CBS News, Miami. Thank you for joining us for this special presentation celebrating Hispanic heritage. As always, keep it right here to CBS News Miami for up-to-the-minute breaking news and weather 24 hours a day.